A few years ago, a young, frustrated journalist named Kayla Chadwick wrote an essay called I Don't Know How I Can Explain to You That You Should Care for Other People. In it, she expressed her frustration with people who did not see eye to eye with the way she defines care for the world. Personally, I'm happy to pay an extra 4.3% for my fast food burger if it means the person making it for me can afford to feed their own family. If you aren't willing to fork over an extra 17 cents for a Big Mac, you're a fundamentally different person than I am. She makes the same point about her willingness to pay taxes to better public schools, because all children deserve a quality free education. And she says she's willing to pay more taxes so that the poor can have health care. Poverty should not be a death sentence in the richest country in the world. If you're okay with thousands of people dying of treatable diseases just so the wealthiest among us can hoard still more wealth, there is a divide between our worldviews that can never be bridged. She concludes by saying, I cannot have political debates with these people. Our disagreement is not merely political, but a fundamental divide on what it means to live in a society, how to be a good person, and why any of that matters. The problem is that there are different ways of defining a good person. There's no easy divide between people who care and people who don't care. Certainly, I like to think that I'm always a person who cares, but I'd be lying if I said I'm also at times one of those who don't care. Yeah, that's just me on a different day. To love my neighbor as myself, which is the theme of the sermon today, is that I've got to be willing to take a walk in my neighbor's shoes. It does no good to say, just care. What makes all the difference is to look to Jesus, who gives us the power and the example of what it means to care. If we learn anything from Jesus, I should regularly be looking to love my neighbor as myself, especially with regard to the most vulnerable neighbors among us. This is what Jesus did. He famously chose the marginalized, the oppressed, the poor, the sick, the aged, the feeble, and he tried to see things through their eyes. What does that look like for you and me? Let's take, for instance, the controversy over monuments to Confederate war heroes that's been making headlines. A conservative writer for The Federalist, Catesby Lee, argues that we need to keep these statues because we must know our history, and to destroy public monuments, Confederate or not, is to destroy part of the nation's history. Lee also argues these Confederate monuments are important symbols that idealize the virtues of honor and bravery, which are meant to inspire and encourage. What's more, he believes a deeper agenda is at play that goes beyond statues. The ideology and rhetoric of the Vandals are clear. When they go after statues of distinguished figures in our nation's history, they tell us the American political system was erected on a foundation of systemic racism. Thus, the Vandals see history in simplistic, vacuous terms reduced to slogans and Twitter memes. And what about those who are calling for the removal of these statues? Many of these people view them as modern-day symbols of slavery and racism. There are 1,600 statues to Confederate heroes in the U.S., like the famous bronze figure of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia, which recently came down. This is something that's been called for for years, and back in 1928, African-American author W.E.B. Du Bois wrote this, The inescapable truth is that Robert E. Lee led a bloody war to perpetuate slavery. Though some say he never fought for slavery, well, for what did he fight? State rights? Nonsense. The South cared only for state rights as a weapon to defend slavery. Lee either knew what slavery meant when he helped maim and murder thousands in its defense, or he did not. And if he did not, he was a fool. If he did, Robert Lee was a traitor and a rebel, not indeed to his country, but to humanity and to humanity's God. It's clear that Du Bois speaks for many Americans today, blacks as well as whites, when he sees these monuments as offensive, hateful, and divisive. They are more likely to be championed by the one-time oppressor than the historically oppressed. So what would Jesus do? To lean toward Jesus is to lean closer to the side of the oppressed. It is to take to heart Jesus' words to love our neighbor as ourselves, especially those neighbors who are marginalized and vulnerable. 
But wouldn't the removal of memorials to Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis put us on a slippery slope to removing statues for every notable American who ever owned slaves? Harvard Law professor Annette Gordon-Reed likes to make the distinction between monuments for those who helped create the United States and those who tried to destroy it. Both Washington and Jefferson were critical to the formation of the country and to the shaping of it in its early years. The Confederate statues were up not just after the war, but largely during periods of civil rights tension in the 20th century, to send a message about white supremacy and to sentimentalize people who had actively fought to preserve the system of slavery. No one puts a monument up to Washington or Jefferson to promote slavery. The monuments go up because without Washington, there likely would not have been an American nation, and to Thomas Jefferson because of the Declaration of Independence, which every group has used to make their place in American society. I think on these two, Washington and Jefferson in particular, you take the bitter with the sweet. The main duty is not to hide the bitter parts. <laughs> and being upfront with the bitter parts is at the heart of what's recently sent millions of people out into the streets in protest. Many Christians watch with approval, for we welcome the kingdom of God when we welcome justice, fairness, and equality, which is at the heart of today's gospel. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, Jesus begins, and he tells us a series of analogies to help us better understand what this kingdom is all about. Jesus says it's like a man who finds buried treasure and is so excited he sells everything he has to get it. Jesus also talks about a second man looking for pearls who finally finds one and he too sells everything to get it. Our present moment when we've seen so plainly the injustices inflicted upon our brother George, our brother Aubrey, sister Brianna, just to name a few, have been so stark and the reaction so swift that a movement has been sparked that can offer the possibility of real change. And we need to sell all we have to get that. We have to do all we can to acquire the treasures of freedom and equality and justice and to obtain the pearl of peaceful living one with another, where skin color is appreciated and honored and not mocked and demeaned. For too long, we whites have allowed the comfort of the majority to hold sway over the injustice of the minority. We have enslaved, incarcerated, and isolated our brothers and sisters of color in plantations, in prisons, in ghettos, and never come to a proper reckoning of the harm we have caused or the problems that persist because of it. But now we have a moment in time when some real advances can be made. Key to Jesus' kingdom is hope, and hope that even the most grave and unforgivable can keep us from obtaining somehow, some way, shalom. But pastor, what can I do? I have no status or great riches. How can I help? All I have is this little mustard seed. Jesus says he can use that. Writer Madeline Langell says this, in a very real sense, not one of us is qualified, but it seems that God continually chooses the most unqualified to do his work to bear his glory. If we're qualified, we tend to think we have done this job ourselves. If we're forced to accept our evident lack of qualification, then there's no danger that we will confuse God's work with our own or God's glory with our own. Yes, our mustard seed is enough, says Jesus. That mustard seed may be a letter to a legislator. It may be an overture to someone who doesn't look like you, to talk on the phone, to deepen a relationship. It may be to turn the course of a conversation or to speak out when a gracious joke is heard. That mustard seed may be to read a book, to watch a movie, to think more critically about who we are and what others who have been oppressed and overlooked have been or are going through. There are a lot of mustard seeds out there, and now is the time to plant them. We need them to grow. We need them to take over. Speaking to my white friends, a recent study found that only 3% of whites had deep enough relationships with a black person to ask them to be a part of their wedding party. Blacks have been reaching out for a long time. It's time for whites to also. We are socialized and educated to read about King Henry VIII and Marie Antoinette, but what about King Shaka or Queen Jinga? Healing the racial divide, reconciling division, setting a right, what's been way off track is the work of the kingdom. It's our work as followers of Jesus.
Jesus ends his talk with a stark reckoning that at the end of time there will be an opportunity for the good work we do to be recognized. There are productive and effective things we can do, and there are a whole lot of ineffective and unproductive things we can do, like nothing. But this is not the time to do nothing. This is the time for us to declare that racism is wrong and bigotry is an abomination. Down must come our own personal monuments that keep us rooted in harmful beliefs and racist traditions that fail to fully promote the justice, which is at the heart of the kingdom of God. Now is the time for you and me to leave here and to go out into the world loving our neighbor as ourselves, realizing anew the breadth of that word neighbor. For it means especially the marginalized, the vulnerable, and the overlooked. For this is our part of bringing the kingdom of God home. Amen. <laughs>